Hello and welcome to Ways to Change the World. I'm Krishnan Giri Murthy and this is the podcast in which we talk to extraordinary people about the big ideas in their lives and the events that have helped shape them. My guest this week is one of the world's most famous public intellectuals, historians and writers. Yuval Noah Harari is probably most famous for his book Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind, which is an extraordinary way of looking at people and our history. It's macro, but also really digestible. And he has taken some of the key elements of that original work and transformed it now into graphic books to try and reach new, often younger audiences. The latest instalment of that has just been published, and Yuval joins me now from Israel. The new book is a graphic version of Summer Sapiens, um, and it's the second one you've done. Now, wh why are you doing this? Why are you seeking to reach people in this way? Well, I think my main job these days is to serve as a kind of bridge between the scientific community and the general public to try and bring the latest findings and discoveries of, of history, of biology, of other sciences to, to the general public. Because, you know, if, if you don't make the effort, then the space you live gets filled with conspiracy theories and fake news and whatever. So part of the responsibility of scientists is not just to discover things, but also to communicate them. And it's not really a kind of a graphic version of Sapiens because it's not Sapiens with illustrations. We try to come from a very different direction and created a host of fictional characters and scenarios that enabled us to rethink many of the key ideas of Sapiens. Can you get the subtleties and the complexity into it or is it, an, is it a simplified version? I think in, in many ways it's more complex rather than, than more, more simple. It forces you to answer a lot of very difficult questions that in the, in the, the original version I could simply ignore. In, in, in the first uh, volume, when I talk about the relations between Homo sapiens and Neanderthals, we know now from scientific research that there has been some sexual relations between sapiens and Neanderthals and even children born to um, mixed parents. And I wrote about it in the first book, but I could ignore the question of how did the couple actually look like? Was it a sapiens woman with a Neanderthal man or vice versa? Because when you write a book in words, if you're not sure about something, or you wish to avoid something, you can just speak very generally in the abstract. Words can be abstract. But images are almost never abstract. Images are concrete. So you have to commit yourself much more. If you show a sapiens Neanderthal couple, you can't just show a general couple. You have to decide, is it a sapiens man with a Neanderthal woman or vice versa? Maybe it's a gay couple. And what's their skin color? What type of hair do they have? And you need to go back to the, to the books, to the articles, and do more research in order, because hopefully you, just, you don't just invent these things. Well, I suppose you have to project a little in terms of what they may have looked like or what, what they might have been doing, but also what the attitudes around them might have been. Yeah. Many of our most complicated discussions were about creating the fictional characters that kind of guide the readers or, 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 or take center stage in the graphic novel. So we have this key character of Detective Lopez that she is a, a detective, she's a police detective, and she investigates the biggest cases in history. So in the first volume, she investigated the disappearance of the big animals shortly after humans spread over the world. She's on the trail of the worst ecological serial killers in the history of the planet, which turn out, of course, to be human beings, homo sapiens. And in, in this volume, she has a new case uh, which is the sources of inequality. Where does social inequality and racism and hierarchy, where do they come from? Having a fictional character and a fictional plot traveling through history gave us the ability to kind of engage with, you know, very difficult material, very controversial material with a light touch. 
What have you concluded then about where racism and prejudice comes from? Ultimately, they come from the human mind and from the stories we tell ourselves and we tell others. They don't come from the outside world. You know, some people compare sometimes racism to, to, to a virus, to an epidemic. But you, and yes, people infect each other with racism but they don't infect other people with racism by sneezing on them and passing on a virus. They infect other people with racism by telling stories. There is nothing in nature that forces us to be racist. And I just recently read some very interesting studies about uh, uh, chimpanzees, that chimpanzees, for example, they, they never discriminate on the basis of your fur color. This is unique to human beings. They came up with this idea that the color of your hair and your skin, oh, this is very important. This should be the basis for a social hierarchy. Where did hierarchy come from? Any kind of hierarchy? There are two types of hierarchies. There are certainly kind of natural hierarchies that emerge in any group of people or really in any group of animals. Chimpanzees have hierarchies, chickens have hierarchies because people have different abilities, different personalities. So you, you, you throw together a bunch of individuals, you are bound to get some kind of hierarchy. But these hierarchies, they are based on personal familiarity with each, with each other, and they don't tend to solidify into you know, a rigid social or political stratification that lasts for thousands of years. In humans, you also see the first type of hierarchy. You go to a kindergarten and look at a group, 20, 20 kids age four or five, you will see hierarchy. But when you zoom out and you look at human society on the wide level, what you see is a completely new type of hierarchies, which are much more rigid, which are based not on personal acquaintance, but on belief in all kinds of really fictional stories. For thousands of years, we have seen the emergence of numerous types of societies and cultures, and they all came up with one kind of hierarchy or the other. But where do you think it's taking us? You know, what is the direction of progress, if you like? Is it, is it towards greater individual freedoms and egalitarianism, or, or could it take you towards a, a reboot of dictators and kings? It can go either way, it's up to us. It was the same, by the way, in the 20th century. The new communication technology of the modern age, it enabled for the first time to have large-scale democracies, but it also enabled for the first time to have large-scale totalitarian societies. A totalitarian society is a society which it's not just there is a dictator that, that, that decides everything. It's a society that interferes with every aspect of your life. This was impossible in previous eras. Like if you look at the Roman Empire, so you have an emperor that decides everything, but if you are a small peasant in a remote province, they can't really control your life, it's impossible. The first time that it became possible to have large-scale totalitarian societies was again in the 19th and 20th century. And you see it with the rise of the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany and communist China and, and so forth. So even that technology could go both ways. It's the same with the new technologies we are developing right now, whether it's social media, whether it's artificial intelligence, it can create more egalitarian democratic societies or it can create the worst totalitarian systems that ever existed things far worse than the Soviet Union or Nazi Germany. To give just a few ideas or a few examples of how this can work, so if you look at the kind of more optimistic scenario, then I know that social media gets a lot of criticism and I also criticize certain aspects of it a lot, but on the whole, it did something good. It allowed more groups to organize themselves and it allowed more people to join the public conversation. And this, of course, creates instability. Because the old agreements, the old consensus is shaken. If you imagine, say, a table, 
with 10 people around the table uh, deciding how to manage society, and suddenly 20 more people join the conversation, they are going to have opinions. They are going to have new interests. So it creates a lot of chaos. And we are living through it right now. But if you're able to kind of contain this chaos and reach a new consensus, the result will be a much better society, a much more egalitarian society. And we've seen it before. Again, if you look at the 1960s, this was another period when a lot of new groups entered the public conversation. And the result at first was a lot of chaos. If you think that now things are bad, you look at the 1960s with all the riots and all the social tensions. And at the same time, you look at the Soviet Union in the 1960s, and everything is so peaceful and quiet, and there is just one TV channel, and everybody agrees on the same reality. 20 years later, it's the Soviet Union that collapses, not the United States, because the West have found ways to kind of contain the chaos and create a really more open, not a perfect society, of course, but a more open, more egalitarian society. I hope we can do the same thing now. But of course, there is also the dangerous potential of the new technologies. And as I said, that the biggest danger is the rise of, of new totalitarian regimes, worse than anything we've seen before, because for the first time in human history, it's now possible to follow everybody all the time. And you now have AI algorithms, which unlike human beings, these algorithms are able to process enormous amounts of information very fast. And therefore, we are in a position, not only that you can follow everybody all the time, you can get to know people better than they, under, than they know themselves. If you collect enough information on me and you have enough computing power, you can get to know me better than I know myself, better than my husband knows me, better than my mother knows me. If this is not managed wisely, this is a recipe for the worst totalitarian regime that ever existed. There is no privacy. Is the biggest act of uh, rebellion or emancipation to get rid of these devices? No, it won't work. Even if you don't have a device, you are constantly watched and recorded by the devices of others. If you live in a democracy, then by their smartphones and their cameras and whatever. And if you live in a place like Xinjiang, or if you live in the occupied territories that Israel occupies, nobody asks you. You're monitored all the time. So it's not a question of, I'll throw away my smartphone. As individuals, we are not very powerful. If you want to make a change in the world, you need to organize with other people. This is our superpower. If you want to make a change, join our organization. And we need political action. We need regulation of these things. We need agreements within countries, between countries, how to manage these powerful new technologies. There are some guidelines we can follow. I'll give three simple rules that can make things much better. First of all, we should have a, a very clear rule that if somebody collects information on me, this information can be used only to help me, not to manipulate me. We have these rules, for instance, with doctors. My personal physician knows a lot of things about me, very private, and it's not something new. It's been just like this for years. But the understanding is that the doctor can use this information only to help me, not to sell it to a third party, like my boss or an insurance agent or a political party, in order to manipulate me. The second principle is that you should never allow all the information to be concentrated in one place, whether it's a company or whether it's a government. It should always be separated. It's maybe less efficient for the algorithms, but inefficiency is a feature, not a bug. If we have something which is too efficient, this is the road to dictatorship. And thirdly, whenever you increase the surveillance, the monitoring of individuals, you must simultaneously increase monitoring of the government and the corporations. What we see now, the problem is not that we have more powerful tools of communication and surveillance. That's not necessarily bad. The problem is it works only one way. 
the governments and corporations use it to monitor us while they remain completely opaque. They know everything about me. I don't know how much tax the president pays or why the money of the government goes here and not there. The problem is that it's not yet a political issue. When I look at the political debates today in the world, let's say in election campaigns, they don't talk about these things. Like what's the difference between Republicans and Democrats with regard to their policy on artificial intelligence? What's the difference between them with regard to their policy on surveillance? I don't know, because they don't talk about these things. And we don't have the political debate, partly because the people who really understand what is happening, they don't start political parties, they build startups to make billions. We also put these people in power, the people who are using these powers. So what does history tell us about why we keep populists in positions of power? It's, it's, you know, it's the oldest trick in the book. It's divide and rule. The way to power for a dictator is to divide society, to create distrust between citizens. Because in order to function, a democracy needs trust between the citizens. I must trust that the other party, my political rivals, I don't agree with them. Maybe I even think they are stupid, but I don't think they are evil. I don't think that they want to harm me. That's the basis for a democracy. Then, even if I lose the election, I'm willing to accept the, the verdict of the majority of citizens. But if I think that the other party, they are not my rivals, they are my enemies, they want to destroy my way of life, they want to enslave me, then I will do anything, legal or illegal, to win the elections, and if I lose, I will not accept the verdict. So in this situation, you can have a civil war or you can have a dictator. A dictator doesn't need trust between citizens. Actually, it's better for a dictator if people fear and hate each other. Then they can't unite in order to force the dictator out. Dictatorship in this sense is like a weed. It can grow anywhere. But democracy is like a delicate flower. It needs preconditions to succeed. And one key precondition is trust between the different segments of society. And what populists do all over the world is the same trick. They locate pre-existing wounds in, in the community, places where people disagree. And instead of trying to heal the wounds, they stick their finger into it and try to enlarge it and inflame it as much as possible to destroy the trust between the citizens, and then they offer themselves as the leader for one tribe. It's no longer a community. It's now warring tribes. And they place themselves at the head of one tribe, promising to defeat the other. You know, there's a lot of talk these days about the resurgence of nationalism. But I don't think that these people are nationalists. They are actually anti-nationalists. Nationalism is not about hating foreigners and hating minorities. Nationalism really is about loving your compatriots and caring about them. So most populists, they depict themselves as great patriots because they hate foreigners and because they hate minorities. But what they actually do is to destroy the national community instead of fostering love and care between the different parts of the national community, they deliberately spread hatred and fear. But do, do you think we are sort of on a trajectory where more, more and more people are, are going to be less empowered? You know, you mentioned artificial intelligence and you've talked before, I think, about creating a useless class of people, you know, a class of people who literally can't do anything useful or, or money-making in a society. That's pretty apocalyptic, isn't it, as a vision? Uh, yes, it is. Again, it's not a prophecy. We can stop it. But to stop it, we need to be aware of the danger. And I think there is a double danger. There is an economic danger and a political danger. The economic danger is that because of automation, a lot of jobs will disappear. 
a lot of new jobs will emerge. I'm not saying that there, will be, there won't be any jobs. But in order to fill the new jobs, you will need high skills. You will need to retrain yourself. And rich countries and rich people, they will be able to afford this process of retraining or reinventing yourself. So they will be OK. They will actually be much better than OK. They will be even more wealthy and powerful because they will be the winners of this new economy. Poorer countries and poorer people who don't have the resources to retrain themselves, they will lose what they have already, and they will not be able to enjoy the fruits of this new economy. So you will get a much more unequal world, a world in which most of the wealth and power is concentrated in just a few countries or a few places. That's the big economic danger. The political danger is that beyond what I talked earlier about digital dictatorships, even in, in democracy, a very big problem is an algorithmic takeover. What does it mean, an algorithmic takeover? It means that more and more decisions about our daily life or about government policy are taken not by human beings, but by AI algorithms. So to give an example, you apply to the bank to get a loan. It's not a human being that goes over your data and decides, no, you won't get a loan. It's an algorithm that decides not to give you a loan. Now, the problem with that is that algorithms make decisions in a fundamentally different way than humans. So even if you have a law that says that you must be given access to understand why the bank rejected your request for a loan, you will not be able to understand. Why? Because humans make decisions on the basis of a few salient points. Like if I'm a human banker and your request comes to me, so I look at your data and usually I will make decision on the basis of three or four salient factors. Like uh, your previous credit history, and maybe if I'm a racist, based on your skin color. Now, an algorithm doesn't work like that. An algorithm is able to take into account thousands and thousands of data points, each with a very small weight. And if you ask why the algorithm rejected my request for a loan, so the bank can print out millions of pages of, of data and tell you, that's why the algorithm went over all this and calculated that you are not credit worthy. And our minds just can't understand this type of decision making. And it can be on a personal level. It can also be on the level of an entire country that to decide whether to raise or lower interest rate, for example. It will not be done by a human banker or finance minister. It will be done by an AI. Already today, how many people really understand the financial system? I guess less than 1% of people really understand finance. In 20 years, the number of people who will be able to understand the global financial system will be exactly zero. It will be so complicated that only AI would be able to manage it. And what is the meaning of a democratic government when the humans supposedly in charge don't understand the financial system. And this kind of algorithmic takeover, it threatens both democracies, but even more so dictatorships. Actually, it's easier for AI to take over a dictatorship than to take over a democracy. A democracy is complicated. A dictatorship is simple. Just imagine what happens, let's say, to the Chinese Communist Party if it gives an algorithm the authority over promotions and demotions in the party. Very soon, the one who controls the Communist Party is not the Politburo, it's the algorithm. Or think about this kind of classical case that you have a dictator uh, who is always afraid that somebody will assassinate him. And the AI system in charge of protecting the dictator calls the dictator and tells him, uh, dear leader, I've discovered a plot by the defense minister to assassinate you. Do you want me to kill him first? Now the dictator has a dilemma. If he says no, 
that he, then he's in danger of being assassinated. If he says yes, he is no longer in power. He is just a puppet in the hands of the AI because whenever the AI sees that something th threatens it, it can always tell the dictator, look, this person or that group, they are trying to take over, let me eliminate them. So even if you still have a human being as a dictator, the real ruler will be the AI. How did you come to sort of this, this way of approaching history? I, I studied the Middle Ages a lot. <laughs> My real kind of uh, expertise is it's not AI and is not the 21st century, it's the Middle Ages. And it gives you a much broader perspective on things, looking at the way that people lived and thought in a completely different period. There's still a leap, isn't there, from academic history to the kinds of books that you're writing that are so sort of macro and, and give people sort of moments of clarity as they're reading or different ways of thinking about the world. Is that something that just came to you or was it sort of something you had to work out? No, it, it took time to develop, but I think that the key was that I, I followed the questions and not my own answers or my own hypothesis. I had some very big questions about history or about the world and I didn't come up with some thesis that tries to answer the question. I just follow the question wherever it leads. And if I don't know something or I don't know the answer to something, I, I'm happy with just leaving it with, I don't know. So uh, for instance, in, in Sapiens, one of the big questions of history is why Europe became the dominant power in the world in the modern age. And you have, you know, like dozens of theories about geography, about climate, about culture, Christianity, whatever. And the more I read, the, the more I understood nobody knows. It's just one of these things, maybe we'll know in the future, but we don't really know. It's maybe an accident of history. There are so many things we don't understand about the world, and it's better to acknowledge our ignorance than to come up with some fanciful theory and insist, make the facts fit, fit, with our theory, I believe that the, like the biggest discovery of science, the biggest discovery of the scientific revolution was the discovery of ignorance. For thousands of years, human civilizations, human cultures built themselves on certain knowledge. Like every human culture had its holy book or holy prophet or mythology or whatever, which was supposed to give them perfect knowledge of the world they refused to admit the ignorance of humankind, which is why they also didn't invest much time and effort in looking for new knowledge, because we already know everything. The big discovery of the scientific revolution was that we don't know. We don't understand the world, we don't know where humans come from, we don't understand the political system, the economic system, and this is still, I think, the key to scientific advance being able to acknowledge your ignorance and to even be comfortable with it. When did that happen then? When did people start saying that? One of the places you see it for the first time is with geography and world maps. If you look in the Middle Ages at world maps being drawn all over the world, in Europe, in China, in the Middle East, what strikes me when I look at these maps, they are complete maps of the world. Like you get a map from medieval Europe that shows you the whole world. Now, of course, he didn't know anything about America or about Southern Africa or about Australia, it, but it didn't bother them. They still depicted the world they knew as the entire world. And when the something was missing, they just filled it in with all kind of monsters or stories from the Bible or whatever. And then in the early 16th century, you start getting these amazing maps, which are part empty. You get these charts of the world where you see some part of the world like Europe drawn with, with, with a lot of details. And then at a certain point, the line just disappears. And it's obvious there is something there, but the map maker had the kind of intellectual courage to just leave it blank. We don't know what's, what's out there. And this is an invitation to go and explore. If you go to a medieval cathedral in the 12th century, and you see this entire map of the world, 
then you have this comfortable feeling, we know everything. We don't need to go and explore. If you look at a map from the 16th century and you see the coastline and suddenly nothing, blank, it arises your curiosity, hey, what's there? Maybe we go out and find out. So to what extent then do you think we, we are actually in control of our own destiny? I mean, you've said a couple of times in answers, it doesn't have to be that way. But do we really have choice? I think we have a lot of choice. History is not deterministic. Many of the big changes in history were extremely unlikely. If you think, for example, about the rise of Christianity, if you go around the Roman Empire in say, the third century, then you have so many different religions and cults and, and, and philosophies and whatever, and you have this tiny esoteric Jewish sect that believes that a Jewish preacher who was crucified by the Romans 200 years ago is actually the Lord of the universe. And it's a very tiny esoteric sect. Nobody would imagine that within a couple of decades, this sect, Christianity, will take over the Roman Empire. But it happened. If you think, for instance, about the Bolshevik Revolution, in 1914, there were just a couple of thousand Bolsheviks in a country of almost 200 million people. Nobody could imagine that within three or four years, this tiny group of revolutionaries would take over the, the Russian Empire. Many of the events of history are very accidental. And also, we need to understand that even kind of structural changes, like the invention of a new technology, they can always be directed towards different destinations. If you think about the big technological inventions of the 20th century, electricity, radio, automobiles, you could use them to create completely different societies. If you look today at North Korea and South Korea, which are so different in their politics, in their social structure, in their culture, the difference between them is not technological. North Korea has access to the same technology as South Korea. There is no big difference in geography, in climate, in history, in, in genetics. It's the same people, Koreans. But you see that the same people in the same place with the same technology build completely different societies. So it's the same in the 21st century. We can use AI and biotechnology and social media and all that to build the most egalitarian societies that ever existed. Or we can use them to create the worst totalitarian nightmares that ever existed. It's, it's still up to us to make this choice. And so can I, can I ask you then to apply that to your own, to, to Israel, to your own country, and how you feel things could go? Things can go in many different ways. Again, uh, it, 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 it's, it's true of all countries in the world. Things have not gone very well in, in the last few years, I can say, with Israel, especially with regard to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Some people say, oh, this conflict is hopeless. There is just no solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And this is nonsense. It's not like, you know, a mathematical problem that has no solution. In mathematics, some problems really have no solutions, and mathematicians can prove to you that this problem is impossible. You cannot solve it. Politics is not like that. There are solutions to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. What we lack is motivation. Over the last decade or two, what was missing is the motivation on both sides. If I look at my own side, the Israeli side, I can say that there are like maybe three main reasons while the motivation for solving the problem, the conflict, has diminished or almost disappeared, one reason was the reaction to the wave of violence in the early 2000s that Israelis felt that, hey, we try to solve it. In reaction, we got the worst wave of violence and terrorism, so we are not going to try again. Uh, a second reason is that Israel has just become far more powerful than ever before. And this goes back to technology. Uh, 20 years ago, or 30 years ago, Israel had the big problem in controlling the occupied territories and the millions of Palestinians who lived there. It was just very difficult to control millions of people against their will. 
and you had the first intifada and the second intifada, and everybody expected the third intifada, which never came. What changed in the meantime is technology. Israel is one of the leading countries in the fields of cyber and surveillance technology. And this new technology gave it the power to control far more effectively than ever before millions of people against their will. And Israel feels just much stronger than it was 20 or 30 years ago, not just with regard to the Palestinians, also with regard to the neighboring Arab and Muslim countries. What happened in the intervening 20 years is first that you had the Arab Spring and the American invasion of Iraq earlier, which basically knocked out most of the traditional enemies of Israel. There is no Syrian army anymore. There is no Iraqi army, it's all gone. So this improved the situation of Israel. And also again, the technology, one of the reasons of the wave of new agreements, Israel has been signing with the uh, uh, Gulf states and Saudi Arabia and so forth. It's not only common alliance against Iran, it's also they want the Israeli technology. They want the cyber abilities. They want the surveillance technology. And it's an integral part of this new friendship between Israel and these regimes. So Israel feels we don't need to make compromises. We are much more powerful. And the third ingredient is a wave of kind of messianic thinking. Whereas 20 years ago, 30 years ago, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict was mainly a national conflict, it has now increasingly become a religious conflict with larger parts of the Israeli population becoming more religious and uh, believing in messianic visions. They don't want peace. They want to realize their religious fantasies. So when you take all these three factors together, you get the situation that we are now in. But again, none of this is deterministic. If people gain the motivation, there are solutions. So you, you said you, you follow the questions, which is how you got to where you are as a historian. In terms of some answers that you would choose, if you could change the world in any way, what would you do? We can go to the you know, really general stuff like world peace, but this, is, this doesn't really add anything. Focusing on, on the issue of, of the ecological crisis, which is one of the biggest challenges we face, I would like to see 2% of global GDP starting this year devoted to developing eco-friendly technology and uh, eco-friendly infrastructure. I'm not an expert in this particular field, but from the reviews and researches that I've that, that read, I got the feeling there is a widespread consensus among the experts that this is what we need to prevent catastrophic climate change. People have shifted very quickly from not believing in climate change to feeling completely helpless. That it's, it's too late, there is nothing we can do. We need to stop in the middle. It's a very serious problem, but it's not hopeless. And the number to remember is 2%, that's it. If we invest 2%, of global GDP annually, we can solve this. And you know, 2% of global GDP is a lot, but it's completely feasible. This is exactly what politicians are good at. If you say we need to shift 20% of the budget to a new thing, that's probably impossible. But shifting 2% of the budget from A to B, this is the job of politicians. So we need to remember this simple number and not lose hope and pressure our politicians with this concrete demand, invest 2% of GDP in solving climate change. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our producer is Rachel Evans. You can watch all of these interviews on the Channel 4 News YouTube channel. Until next time, bye-bye.